Welcome, Bill Amarat. I just want to welcome him to um, JBS today. We are so happy to have him join us. Um, prior to coaching, Bill has an extension, extensive career in marketing, brand management, consulting, and advertising. Several consumer packaged goods, pharmaceutical, and healthcare companies, including Procter and Gamble, Sharon Plow, now Merck, Johnson and Johnson, Panasonic, and Del Monte Foods. Bill is an amazing presenter, and today he's going to talk about the inspiration of motivation on your job search. It's been widely accepted by job seekers of all ages and backgrounds, and we are so excited to have him here today. You'll see why he will be here today and again in the future. Welcome, Bill. Hey, thanks, Lisa. Glad to be here. I recognize some of the names on here, but just making sure either thumbs up or in the chat, you can hear me fine. Um, this presentation came out of after I've been doing this work, which has been for about nine and a half years now as a career development coach, about five years in, I realized that I was putting all the information, the materials together for people, and then realized that something wasn't landing. And it wasn't that the tools weren't there, it was how the tools were being used and why. So this whole presentation is related to the whys of your job search. And hopefully there'll be something of value here. Um, I pulled a whole lot of memes off the internet that I'd get sued if I published them, but I can use them in presentations. And they are just representative examples of certain aspects of job search and your own mindset and motivation that goes along with it. So hope this works for you. I will do this for probably 35 to 40 minutes and then take some Q&A. And then I have another commitment at two o'clock, so I'll have to bounce off. But if you want to connect with me anytime offline, happy to respond to you there as well. So um just to go a little bit into what the agenda is all about uh what is your career purpose and there'll be a presentation that i do next week that's going to go into that in a lot greater detail about aligning your career purpose with your life purpose search goals and milestones any landing strategies or even potential reinvention that some of you may be going through um what about the job market what is it all about and then th the rest of it is really mindset related to your job search. So I'm not going to be talking about resumes, LinkedIn profiles, outreach, interviewing skills, and all that, at least not in detail. I'll mention them. But I'm really going to be focusing on what's going on in that conversation uh, and the six inches between your left ear and your right ear that's either benefiting you or maybe even hindering you from whatever it is you're going to be doing next. So um, a little background on me. Uh, the majority of my uh, career, corporate career, before becoming a consultant in the 2000s and then a career development coach in 2013 is in marketing, product management, advertising, and new product development. And Lisa mentioned some of the companies. I had my first job as a uh, two and a half hour- Meeting is every... being recorded. Oh, uh, first, first job was uh, two and a half two hours every hour. afternoon um, delivering newspapers. And that paper route was in my family of five other siblings until my daughter my daughter, my youngest sister graduated from high school uh, for 18 years, necessary source of income. Um, after college, I worked for General Electric and then after grad school, started at Procter & Gamble and then spent a, a fair amount of time in the healthcare pharmaceutical industries and did some other consumer product work after that. Very active in uh, sports, sports, fundraising, community activities. Um, I can still play at a local YMCA basketball. Whoever has either two devices on or some echoes that, that may not serve the rest of the group. Pamela, is that you? I'm going to, I'm going to mute you here. Okay. Um, and I've been doing career counseling and coaching since the eighties. Ironically enough, I was blessed to have an internship at the Indiana university business placement office, which had 650 companies come every year. And it was like grand central station five days a week. 2,000 students, 650 companies, and I was part of that business placement office. And that's where I got the groundwork for what I'm doing now, clearly with people at, at higher levels than college graduates. I've also been the MC at about 250 job fairs uh, in eight states over nine years. I've worked with clients in four countries, and I think I'm up at 24 states right now, including Boca Raton, Florida, for another person who's on the line here. Um, I also was co-author of a book called Finding God's Purpose for Your Career. If you reach out to me separately, I have an ebook version of that, which I will be happy to email to you or, or attach it to a LinkedIn message. Okay, um, so I don't know any of your stories, at least current stories. I know a few of you recognize a few of the names, 
where are you right now? Are you employed, generating an income, or are you in transition? When I talk to people about what's happened with their circumstance, I usually say, have you been downsized, right-sized, reorged, let go, separated, fired, or, or other wow. things that happened, maybe you're part of the great resignation, or, or you've had a life event. What happened? I've had several other, several clients who, for various reasons, had to take care of an elderly parent or a sick child or a teenager, whatever it might be, and they have to, they have to leave their jobs, and that's not a very comfortable situation. Um, for what it's worth, all those things that you see there about being in transition, every one of them has happened to me, some of them more than once. So between my own experience and client experience, I can tell you that there isn't anything that surprises me, um, including the walk into a meeting on Thursday thinking you're given an update and to being told that tomorrow's your last day because of budget cuts. And, and I just, you know, you get blindsided by stuff like that. So for what it's worth, my empathy and sympathy goes along with you if, been, if you've been any of the uh, result of any of those. So um, one of the things that I do is I try to focus people on what's going to make them win and the world at large win. And about seven, eight years ago, I found this diagram, what you love, what you're good at, and what pays well. And if you hit that bullseye, it's going to be a win. And then I found one a few, a few years after that, which adds the Venn diagram circle here, that which the world needs. If you can land in the middle of this, you're going to win, you're going to enjoy your work, and the people around you are going to enjoy you, more importantly. And there's a Japanese construct called Ikigai, which roughly translated means purpose. It means Dharma in Sanskrit, but purpose is too weak a word. It's really more encompassing than that. It's like all the reasons that you were put here. And in my coaching, I go by the following philosophy. God put us all here for a variety of reasons. Career is one of the most important. So it's up to us to define and manifest those reasons in the best way that we can. And by doing that, it's part of fulfilling your life mission. So what is your purpose? What is your mission? What's your objective? Those are the first three things that I talk about with any client that I'm working with. Sometimes it's, hey, I got to pay the bills. I need a job within a month. Okay, great. Other times it's, I've been doing this 20 years and I'm really tired of it. I'm not sure what else I want to do. Okay, great. And then somewhere in the middle. And we can work uh, in any of those phases or stages to make things go in the right direction. The big thing that I find is that most people underrepresent themselves. Probably 95% of the resumes that I see need some or significant embellishment because they do not represent the true value that a candidate has provided to the organizations that they have worked with. And, and this is most important, they're not saying what it is they want to do in the future and how they can add value in the future. They're just using it as a chronology of their past. So the, one of the other things we started with right away, what are your skills? And I would suggest that although this is you know, quite entertaining, that it's not a skill you want to represent um, in a job interview or on your resume. Um, I have never tried doing that, but I did find that this was kind of amusing. Um, and grade yourself on these. Branding. I did branding for 20 years, mostly for products and services. Candidly, I find that marketing people is a whole lot more fun than marketing products or services, which is why I do this work. Is your resume with a positioning statement clear, compelling, and concise? Because if it's not, it'll get tossed off to the side, either electronically or in paper. Is your LinkedIn profile, does it, is it inviting? Does it have keyword phrases? Is the about section a real representation of what it is that you can do? For what it's worth, if you want to connect with me on LinkedIn, we can do that. You can do that either right now or you know shortly after the meeting. Happy to do that. And, and if you do, I will send you, again, a copy of that ebook. What's the branding related to your quote unquote cover letter or follow up? Those are all really important things that I'm not going to get into any detail about today because the focus of this is a different place. That said, Without this, you can't do anything. This is like the foundation of a house. You can't put the studs in the sheetrock unless you don't have a good concrete foundation to work from. As far as other milestones in your career search go, grade yourself on these. If your credentials look good and they represent you in the best possible way, are you getting them in front of as many of the right people as possible? Hiring managers, recruiters, networking groups, nonprofits like this one, or anyone else who can provide advice. One of the other things that I work extensively with my clients is how to find the hidden job market, because 
Somewhere between 60 and 70% of all jobs filled are done through the networking capability of either the candidate, the hiring manager, or the hiring company. And that includes hiring internal candidates. All the job posting that you see represent 30 to 40% of the total job market being filled. Just put that in the back in your back pocket. Okay, is it the right geography? And today geography is not nearly as important as it was say three years ago. Why are the roles you're looking for a good fit? Ask yourself those questions as you're putting both your credentials together and your target audience together. Interview approaches, connections, who do you know? Do you have advocates inside and outside the company? Very quick story, a guy I played basketball with for several years in New Jersey, was he got a call from a former colleague and said, hey, Jeff, let's get together for a drink. And it was around the holidays. And Jeff said, okay, let's do it. And Jeff had been commuting an hour and a half one way into the city from New Jersey as an executive in this insurance business for over 20 years. Yeah. So they, they talked about family, they talked about the old company, and then Jeff's friend said to him, say, you know, the real reason I called you here is this. I interviewed with this company in Livingston and they made me an offer, but I didn't take it because I got a promotion during the interview process. I just didn't think it was the right time. But the first person I thought about is you. Would you be interested? Jeff said, 20 minutes from my house, you bet. Four weeks later, he's in the vice president's chair based on the recommendation of somebody that didn't even work for the company. Okay, so advocates are critical. What does tell me about yourself mean? Anybody want to respond in the chat? Or not, I'll break it to you. <laughs> When somebody says, tell me about yourself, that used to be permission to do exactly what Cheryl is saying in your career story summary. I would strongly recommend against that. Have that ready, but I recommend against responding immediately with that. And here's why. You don't know what they really want. Christine has it. What would you like to know? So use your own words, but I coach people on this all the time. Tell me about yourself. Well, there are a lot of aspects of my background that may be relevant for this position. Which ones would you like to discuss that can resolve the issues you're facing right now? You do two things when you say something like that. The first one is this. You tell them that you're there to help. What's going to resolve the issues? What's going to help resolve the issues you're facing He's right crazy. now? The second thing is you're going to force the hiring manager or whoever it is that you're interviewing with to tell you what's really going on with that job. You're not gonna see it in the job description. So when they tell you, we have a new product launch in three, month and we, in three months and we just lost a senior product manager to another company, you know that they're under the gun. Then you can direct all of the accomplishments and the key skills that align with that toward the rest of the conversation. So find out what it is, that, and, and Scott has it, what can you do for me? All right, what can you do for me? What's gonna be of value? You could go round and round in a circle like a shark around the bait and completely miss the point by saying all the things that you're all about. Find out what they need in whatever way that means. Okay, so interview approaches, um, you know, tell me about yourself. You can add value by these five things, match the skills, match the requirements of the job, et cetera, et cetera. And I'm just gonna move on from that. All right, hold on. and. Make sure that you describe with examples what skills you have. I would suggest not using a stick when you do that, but describe what it is that you can do with specific examples. Closing the deal, how well can you negotiate? How well have you built value? One year in college, I came home, didn't have a job, a guy I played baseball with said, why don't you come sell Kirby vacuum cleaners with us? And I did for the whole summer. I sold 12 for the whole summer, five in the last week. I thought about skipping my last year of school. Glad I didn't. But here's the story. The whole mantra of that sale was this. You'd walk into somebody's home, you'd do a demonstration to a rug shampoo. Then you'd say, all these pieces of equipment, the rug shampooer, the vacuum cleaner, all the um, mattress cleaning equipment and the things for the shades and the, and the stairs and everything else. If you bought these separately, it would cost you $1,645. But Mrs. Johnson, you can get this all-in-one Kirby today for $5.95. How does that sound? If you've built your value up during the course of the interview, it's very hard for somebody to say no at the end. 
And the value has to be built up in a way that's going to be relevant for them, not just because it's relevant for you. So I would ask by show of virtual hands, how many of you are in sales? And I can't see all of you because I don't have the whole, actually, I'm going to display out here. Virtual hands, I'm seeing, okay, a few of you raise your hands. I'm going to break it to you. You're all in sales, okay? And you are the product and the service. So if you have a more technical background, IT, manufacturing, logistics, um, all of which I've done at some point in my career very early, but at least I have a point of reference there, and you're not comfortable with the marketing and sales aspects of job search, you need to get comfortable really quickly. And again, I don't know where any of you are in search right now, but I, but I just say that as a general uh, adage in terms of how you go about it. Is your function not in demand anymore? In nine years of doing job fairs, I saw one web developer and one mobile app developer. That's it. There's too much work for them, all right? You don't see any buggy whip salesmen. When I first came to New Jersey, pharmaceuticals and telecom were all the rage. They're not as much anymore. They're declining or consolidating industries. How many of you have a plan B? Do you invest in real estate? Do you do multi-level marketing? Do you have an, an Uber riding account or some such thing? Plan B, anything that's going to provide you with a another source of income at the time that you need it, all right? Uh, let's see. Now I'm going to shift into the real part of this presentation that's intended to get to what is mindset. I'm going to start with reinvention, all right? And I'm, I'm going to be reading from these. Some of them, I'll read all the way through. Some of them I won't. Something uniquely beautiful about a person that grows from their struggles and uses the lessons from their experiences to spread wisdom. I don't care how you fell or what you did. Be the example that shows others that they can overcome the mountain too. The job market. Almost everybody on this call is down in the bottom right segment of this, which is about 25% of the people around the world. This is actually should say more like 8 billion right now as of recently. But again, Understand where you are in terms of what the rest of the world is all about. Generations in the workforce. How many of you experienced this kind of a dynamic in any of the positions that you've had either recently or in the past? And you don't have to jump at once, but what I'm gonna say is baby boomers and age discrimination are a big part of what I've seen in job search, both personally and with my clients. But I will tell you this, if you have these four attributes, there's a place for you. If you can work with people of all ages without parenting them, if you have current skill sets, keyword being current, if you can shift your priorities and tasks on a dime, because that's often what organizations do, and importantly, if you have the energy to show up on Monday morning and get the job done till Friday evening or maybe occasionally on the weekends, there's a place for you. because. People in their 50s, even 60s, even late, you know, 40s are working on problems that the 20 and 30 somethings don't even know exist. And they wouldn't take the initiative in many cases to do anything about them. Use that to your advantage. I'm going to go into now just kind of like, okay, what's going on in your life? What's going on overall and not just career? This hospice nurse did a study of patients that she experienced. Uh, over a very long period of time. And these were the top five reasons uh, or top, time, top five laments, if you will, of somebody that's in a hospice bed. Wish I'd had the courage to live a life true to myself, not that was expected of me. Wish I didn't work so hard. Wish I'd had the courage to express my feelings. Wish I had stayed in touch with my friends and wish that I had let myself be happier. Extremely important on so many levels. 10 important career lessons. This is from another source uh, that I found, and I'm using this with permission. Life is short, your networks matter. Most people will, will go by the adage of your net worth is directly related to your network. Okay, so keep that in mind. Your health will never be a good bargain for success. None of the great moments in life, except for today, of course, happen in front of a computer screen. Never stop learning, diversify. The more skills that you can assemble and integrate into your career-related activities, the better off you're going to be and the more value you'll be. You can go fast alone, but further together. Worrying doesn't achieve anything. Failure is not an end. Happiness is a journey, not a destination. 
So what will your epitaph say? This is another exercise that I use in the book, Finding God's Purpose for Your Career and with clients as appropriate. Are you on the front nine or the back nine? If I'm not on the back nine, I don't want to live as long as it would mean to be on the front nine, if you know what I'm saying. I count life by days, not years, because everybody can wrap their arms around 24 hours, years come and go. I would ask you, and I have an app, there's an app for this, by the way. Um, on my phone, I know that I'm 23,000 days. My mother passed away three years ago, and I'm a, almost exactly 10,000 days younger than she is or was. And I say to myself, what can I do with myself, with my life, and contribute or contribute to society in the 10,000 days between where I am and where she was in a hospice bed? And I think that perspective will provide you with whatever motivation you may or may not have at this particular moment. Is this transition period something that you've been given the opportunity to make any necessary changes, add some skills to your toolbox, pursue something you've always loved or do something you've never done before? And clearly there's some financial and health and time implications associated with this, but transition is always the opportunity. It opens up blocks of time that you may not have had in a long time. As far as Job search time allocation. There was a study done about five years ago and it was in the New York Times and I have not been able to find it to replicate it, but they tracked in 10 minute increments over a week's period, 147 respondents. It turns out that most of them spent less than an hour and a half a day on job search. They were doing everything from shopping to meal prep to errands to exercise to whatever else that they were doing that wasn't related to job search. And it, they never said why, but I asked myself why. And my conclusion is clear direction and destination. If people have a destination in mind, I have found that they'll do anything and everything in order to get there. And if it's clear and they know what they need to do to get there, that's going to be the most important aspect of what their search is all about. A lot of people go through job search in the following way picture yourself somewhere on the Jersey Shore throwing a capable sailboat into the ocean and saying, okay, I'm going to let the Gulf Stream take me wherever it goes. As opposed to, I'm starting out from Sandy Hook and I want to be in Lisbon, Portugal in 15 days. You're going to have a whole lot different perspective as to how you make the journey the second way versus the first. Tribulations and trials in life. What were you doing on September 11th, 2001? What were you doing on April 15th of 2013? Recognize that whatever's going on in your life is not nearly as severe as a vast percentage of the world's population. Sometimes the bad things that happen in our lives put us on the path directly to the best things that will ever happen to us. Two types of pain, pain that hurts and pain that changes. People react differently to tornadoes and floods and bad storms like that. Clearly, they can be very disastrous. I'm not saying they aren't, but they're also a new start. And I'm not suggesting that you go stand in the middle of one, and I'm in country that gets tornadoes all the time. Um, that said, there are things that can clear the path for you that you may not be aware of. The great philosopher Oprah Winfrey said, I trust that everything happens for a reason, even if we are not wise enough to see it. Zig Ziglar, and if you've never read or seen any of uh, his work, he's tremendous, he's passed on. It's not what happens to you that matters, it's how you respond to what happens to you that makes the difference. Life is 10% of what happens to you and 90% of how you react to it. And this now gets into the subject of resilience. Some of you may follow the NFL, know a guy named Andy Reid. In 2012, after 17 successful seasons with the Eagles, they let him go. They were 4-12 and 12 that year, and that wasn't the worst thing that happened to him that calendar year. His son, who was a strength coach on the team, passed away from an overdose. So he lost his son, he lost his job within a couple months of each other. A few days after that, the Kansas City Chiefs called, and they had him come in to interview. He could have moped, he could have said, I'm going to live on an island and, and just take, take it out. He said, no, I'm going to start with Kansas City. And he turned that team around immediately. They made the playoffs for the first time that year than they hadn't made it in previous, the previous 15 years. And eventually they became the Super Bowl 54 champs. 
He's still coaching. It's something he loves doing. The resilience, though, from that year in 2012 is remarkable. Keep away from pe people who try to belittle your ambitions. Small people always do that, but the really great people make you feel that you too can become great. An entire ship, an entire sea of water can't sink a ship. It's only the water that gets inside the ship that will sink it. Similarly, the negativity of the world can't put you down unless you allow it to get inside you. Milton Berle, a great ex-comedian. I know I've I'm, I'm got a lot of dead people on here, but just go with it. If opportunity doesn't knock, make your door. If it doesn't open, it's not your door. I have the willpower and determination to be and resilient like a rock. Determination and perseverance move the world thinking that others will do it for you is a sure way to fail. I don't know if any of you have ever seen this, but this is a rejection letter that was written to Mr. Albert Einstein. They did not want to allow him at the University of Bern in 1907 to complete their doctorate program for the following reasons. You pose an interesting theory in your article called Analan der Physique. We feel that your conclusions about the nature of light and fundamental connection between space and time are somewhat radical. Overall, we find your assumption to be more artistic than actual physics. If you're not willing to learn, no one can help you, but if you're determined to learn, no one can stop you. Difference between a successful person and others is not a lack of strength, but a lack of, or a lack of knowledge, but a lack of will. Some of you may know Robert Kiyosaki, Rich Man, or Rich Dad, Poor Dad, and several other books in the financial arena, which are excellent reads, by the way, and it's better even to implement them. The size of your success is measured by the strength of your desire, the, the size of your dream, and how you handle disappointment along the way. I want you to take a couple of seconds and read all those letters that are together. And look at the quote on the bottom that says, when you change the way you look at things, the things you look at change. There are two ways to read that phrase. Did you read life is nowhere or did you read life is now here? Just a notice moment, no judgment, just a notice. This is one of the most profound statements I've ever heard from anybody considering the source. Helen Keller, who was blind and deaf, said this, optimism is the faith that leads to achievement. Nothing can be done without hope and confidence. Famous failures in life. Don't know if you've seen this before, but this is remarkable in terms of what had happened to each of these individuals and what they became after that. Albert Einstein couldn't speak till he was almost four years old. Michael Jordan, and he talks about this freely, was cut from his uh, high school basketball team as a sophomore, didn't make the team. Walt Disney got fired for not having any imagination. Steve Jobs started the company and then got let go. Oprah Winfrey was demoted from her job in Baltimore, I believe it was, as a news anchor because she, quote, wasn't fit for television. And the Beatles were rejected more than once before they finally made it to the U.S. What strategies have I found to be helpful in terms of your resilience during job search? And this took me quite a while to put this one slide together. The other ones were pretty simple, but this one took quite a while because I wanted to make it short and sweet and, and usable. For me, and this may be different for each of you, but pick from your menu here as to which ones work. All of these work for me. Enjoyable, vigorous exercise three to five times a week. Healthy, nutritional meals. Positive and uplifting people. This could be the most important aspect of your job search is who you're hanging around with. Spiritual activities, reconnect with God and nature and recognize that in the incredible order of the world, you are a major part cog in it or part of it. Do something creative that you really enjoy, but you may not have had the time to do when you're working too much. Sorry about the background noise here. If that's coming through, there's some sirens going on. Um, you know, people that I know who play musical instruments, who paint, who write, who do poetry, whatever it is, do that. It'll clear your mind, make job search a lot easier. Regular laughter, find a few good movies. 
there there are dozens of com comic movies out there, but get your body in the spirit of laughing and and laughing through some of the circumstances you may be going through. And then explore, do something you've never had a chance to do before. I've had the good fortune to travel to all 50 states and I've been, I think, to 27 national parks. Um, haven't traveled internationally that much, but that's on the agenda. Do something you've never done before, you'll never forget it. Overcoming fear and obstacles. Zig Ziglar, as I quote him again, fear has two meanings, face, forget everything and run or face everything and rise. It's entirely your choice as to which one you pursue. When everything seems to be going against you, remember that the airplane takes off against the wind, not with it. If you're ever down in Kitty Hawk, North Carolina on the Outer Banks, it's well worth seeing that um, museum that uh, commemorates the first um, manned flight. The struggle you're in today is, the developing, is developing the strength that you need for tomorrow. When someone tells you you can't, don't believe it, it's a reflection of their limitations, not yours. Joel Osteen, a very, also somebody who, who has very, very positive messages. You can't live a positive life thinking negative thoughts. And whoever the, the yogi or the monk is on the right, beautiful things happen when you distance yourself from the negative. Some of you may have or have read the book called The Secret, You're a Magnet. When you become a magnet of wealth, you attract wealth, health, et cetera, health, love, joy. You must become the magnet of whatever it is you want to bring it to you. There's scientific studies showing that we are effectively like a radio transmitter. And we are also a radio receiver. So when you transmit things at a certain frequency, that's what you're going to get back. And if you're promoting despair, anger, frustration, or whatever, that's what's going to come back to you. On the contrary, health, wealth, love, joy, prosperity, abundance, whatever you want to say, also will come back to you. I really like this one. A bad attitude is like a flat tire. You can't go anywhere until you change it. It doesn't look like that vehicle is in that great a shape anyway, but with the tire flat, you're not going to go anywhere. You can rewire your brain to be happy by simply recalling things that you're grateful for, three things you're grateful for every day for 21 days scientifically proven somebody from ancient greece i'm going to say somewhere around 400 500 bc gratitude is not only the greatest of virtues but the parent of all others profound statement still applies today gratitude is a powerful process for shifting your energy and bringing more of what you want into your life be grateful for what you already have and you'll attract more good what are you grateful for today for those of you who have a pen, or if you want to put it in the chat, I'm going to give us 90 seconds. Oops, hold on a second. I'm going to give us 90 seconds to write down three to five things that you're grateful for. Go. I may make it 60. Okay, these are great. Okay, I'm going to wrap it up. 10 seconds. You can copy the chat from this after we're done, or you can download the chat, I should say. Um, suggest you do that. And when things aren't looking as great as you want them to look, focus on the things you're grateful for, and that will manifest more things that you'll be grateful for going forward. Okay, there's a uh, very powerful Bible verse, asking you shall receive, seeking you shall find. Anybody have the rest of that one? Put it in the chat if you'd like. All right, with no further ado, knock and the door shall be opened up to you. Now to the book of Matthew. Focus more on the people who inspire you than the people who annoy you. You'll get much further in life. And lose others' baggage as quickly as you can, plus your own. 
that's the only quote of mine actually in this whole presentation. I just had to, I had to document that. The best day of your life is not the is the one on which you decide your life is your own. No apologies or, or excuses. No one to lean on, rely on, or blame. The gift is yours. It's an amazing journey, and you alone are responsible for the quality of it. This is the day your life truly begins. Another great quote. Not sure I'd find myself sitting on that rock, but a good life is when you smile often, dream big, laugh a lot, and realize how blessed you are for what you already have. Considering when this quote was delivered, which was in the middle of World War II and the UK was under constant barrage from the Germans, success is stumbling from failure to failure with no loss of enthusiasm, Winston Churchill. He has dozens of other really good quotes as well. Dreams that you dare to dream really do come true and every storm is followed by a rainbow. Keep going, each step may get harder, but don't stop, the view at the top is what you're looking for. This is, and, and again, you can tell I follow sports, but back in 1993, a guy named Jim Valvano, who was a college basketball coach at North Carolina State, they won the national championship in 1983. 10 years later, he is literally fighting for his life, can hardly walk up the stairs to accept the ESPY award for courage. And he gave one of the greatest speeches I've ever heard. And one of the quotes is, there are three things we all should do every day. We should do this every day. Number one is laugh. Number two is think. Number three is have your emotions move to tears. But think about it. If you laugh, think, and cry, it's a full day. It's a heck of a day. You do that seven days a week, and you're going to have something special. Okay? This is, I mean, you can copy this link or click on it or do whatever when the, you know, when the presentation comes out. But just look it up. Uh, and he died a few months after that speech was given as well. The whole story about the donkey, and some of you may have heard this before. But there was a, an old donkey that was in the barn and the, the farmer left the door open and the donkey escaped and he found its way to the edge of the property where he fell into an abandoned well. The farmer found the donkey, looked at it and said, there's no way I'm getting this animal out of here. So he went and got a couple of friends. They looked at each other and said, you know, this donkey's lived a good long life. Why don't we just bury him? So sure enough, they start throwing dirt on top of him. And... Every, every once in a while, the donkey would go and make a lot of noise and everything else. But then they kept throwing dirt on him and he would shake it off. And what do you think happened a couple hours later? You can put that in the chat if you'd like. Okay, I'll tell you the story. The donkey got out. So what's the moral of the story? Is it the absent-minded farmer? Is it the donkey who couldn't see the well? Is it the cruel neighbors who decided they wanted to kill the donkey? No, it's this. If a jackass can do it, so can you. So with that, I'll say that you have great things in front of you with your career as well. And there are myriad ways of applying for jobs. This is a little tongue in cheek, although I, I do believe it's serious. From somebody in the UK, I refer to the recent death of the technical manager at your company and hereby app apply for the replacement of the deceased manager. Each time I apply for a job, I get a reply. There's no vacancy, but in this case, I've caught you red handed. And you have no excuse because I even attended the funeral to be sure that he was truly dead and buried before applying. Attached to my letter is a copy of my CV and his death certificate. Not sure that I would go about it this way, but do what you need to. You, you, you heard about the billboard guy in Manhattan during the financial crisis. He stood out with his wingtips in a suit every day and he got media coverage all over the country and eventually found himself a job. <laughs> 